the kingdom of heaven. The second test needs to be revealed. When the man found it and hid it. Again. Again, the kingdom of heaven. Thank you. Looking for one voice. He comes on a great fire. He was away. Amen. Thank you very much, Aidan. So Aidan has read to us and reminded us of the parable of uh, of the pearl, the, the the fine pearl. A man was looking for pearls and he found one that um, that was worth more than anything else. He recognised such great value and he sold everything he had in order just to have it. And so I want to talk about value and worth this morning. And before we do that, let's come before God and just ask for his, um, his aid through the Holy Spirit to help us to receive and understand his word this morning. Father God, we pray for open eyes, the eyes of our hearts be enlightened, Lord, as our brother Lynn has already prayed for us. So we pray, Father God, that you would open our spiritual ears also, Lord, that we can hear what the Holy Spirit has to say to us as a church. Lord, we pray, Lord God, that our hearts will be softened, Father God, and, um, and, and malleable. Make us to be like putty, Lord God, in your hand, the hand of the master craftsman. Lord God, we are the pot, you are the potter, we are the clay. So have your way in us today, in Jesus' name. It's been said that what we truly value in life will show in what we are willing to give up in order to have it. What we truly value in life will show in what we are willing to give up in order to have it. Jim Elliott was a Christian missionary who preached the gospel to the Hurani people in Ecuador. Um, and he and five of his friends were martyred for their faith. They were speared through the heart for their faith in Christ. And in his journal, um, in Jim Elliott wrote one of the most inspiring and profound quotes that you may or may not know. Or you may not know that it was him that, um, that, that said it. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And so it's all about value. What is valuable to us? What do we see as most valuable in our lives? Another word that closely relates to value is worth. We always want to know what's it worth. What's something worth? Watch the Antiques Roadshow. And they don't care about the history. They don't care about any of all the those minor details. All they care about is how much it's worth. And they always go, do they? They always say, oh, oh, that's really... And you can tell they've got pound signs in their eyes, can't they? They're, like, they're trying to restrain themselves. And they're going, oh, I'm not going to sell it. No, no, it's going to stay in the family. It's going to be a family heirloom being passed down from generation to generation. And, um, and I'm willing to bet the next month is gone. <laughs> but what's it worth? What's worth giving our all to? What's worth giving all of our attention to? What's giving all of our time and effort to? Did you know that the word worship in the Old English is actually spelt and pronounced worth-ship? It comes from the word worth, 
what we find worth in. We worship. We worship what we consider to be worthy and what we attach most value to. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 1 to 16. Oh, sorry, James, I should have got this to you earlier, but can we get that up on the screen if possible, please? Matthew chapter 26, uh, verses 1 to 16. Sorry, 1 to 13. 1 to 13. I'll give you a moment to, uh, to look for it in your Bible while James is finding it on his own. Matthew 26, verses 1 to 13. Found that bit on here. I'll, I'll comment on it now. There we go. So, Matthew 26, verses 1 to 13. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, As you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest whose name was Caiaphas. And they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and kill him. But not during the feast, because they were very religious people, you see. They had lots of integrity. Not during the feast, they said. Or there may be a riot among the people. While Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume which he poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste? they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. I tell you the truth, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. I will read on a little bit, so if you've got, in your, got your Bibles in front of you. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they counted for him 30 silver coins, the price of a slave in those days. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. You get a feeling that Judas really did miss the point, don't you? This passage is about worship and devotion. And when I was looking for an image, I wanted some kind of a PowerPoint, some kind of an image, really, to so we could look at it. And, and as I was looking through, you had your usual Mary washing Jesus' feet, stylized images, and some very sort of archaic, old-fashioned looking images. And then all of a sudden, I came across that. And I don't know how that, how does that make you feel? Please, please feel free to answer. When you look at that, what are you seeing there? Worship, love, gratitude. Yeah, she's being set free. She's de the devotion, and that, that was for me. That was the first word that sort of come to my mind. I, I, it was devotion. This, is, this will make you chuckle a bit, but this is my daughter for you, right? Eloise. <laughs> You'll hopefully get to meet her one day. Um, but she's very quirky, very dry. She's, um, anyway, so I sent this to her, <laughs> thinking it'll be really, it'll really bless her, you know, because um, she loves the Lord, you know. And, um, and anyway, I had, this, I, I had this message back off her. Ugh. Okay. <laughs> I was like, Ellie, that is not the response I want from you. I was expecting. She went, well, I don't like feet. <laughs> She's washing his feet. 
with her tears and drying them with her hair. What has she been through, isn't it? When you look at that image, what has she been through? What has she seen? What has she experienced? What hardships? What pain? And all those things she's brought to the feet of Jesus. And, he's, and his presence is in her. She still has memories. She still has things she can't forget. But somehow his presence is like a healing balm. And he's there, and she, she's holding on to him. Because maybe also, as we know, she knows that he's not going to be with her long. He's not going to be with her long. This passage is about worship and devotion, recognizing and valuing Christ as the most worthy one in our lives. He is, as we sound, worthy of it all. Matthew's whole purpose in writing this gospel is to say, or to show rather, that Jesus is the long-awaited Jewish Messiah who came in fulfillment of the Old Testament prophetic scriptures. In this passage, Jesus reminds his disciples that the Messiah must suffer and die at the hands of evil men in order to fulfill what was promised and what was prophesied. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, so he's been teaching, he's been, um, he's been ministering, he says to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is in two days. The Passover is in two days. When a lamb will be offered up on behalf of the nation to take away the sins of a nation, to atone for their, for their guilt. And the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest and they begin to plot and they begin to plan how they can do away with Jesus. Notice that what Jesus says to his disciples is already being planned behind closed doors. Whether they knew it or not, probably not. The chief priests and their religious leaders of the day were fulfilling prophecy. They were playing their part, whether they liked it or not. God was working his purposes out. You see, they think they have the upper hand, but really they're only doing what God has already decided beforehand. And Jesus has made it known to his disciples. Jesus is way ahead of them. He says, these things must happen. Jesus says time and time again, teaching his disciples the things that they are to expect. As time goes on, as they near the Jerusalem towards that final week, Jesus is only reminding now his friends about what he's already told them before. And they all heard him. Every time he's told them, they've, they've either shut their ears, they didn't want to hear it, or they've questioned, perhaps he meant something else. But there was one person at least who understood exactly what Jesus was talking about. Because this, be honest, Jesus wasn't being confusing in his speech. He was very clear all along. The Son of Man will suffer at the hands of evil men. He will be killed. But on the third day, he will rise again. One person, one person, who we'll call Mary, because she's not named here, but John, in the same account, talking about the same account, tells us who she is. This is Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, who Jesus raised from the dead. They're in Simon the leper's house. It's very likely, scholars think, that Simon the leper was Lazarus' father. And Jesus had, had healed him of leprosy in the past. This was a family that Jesus had a lot to do with. He'd spend a lot, and he spends a lot of time with them. Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, is going to be led like a lamb to be slaughtered in Isaiah 53. That's what he tells us. And Isaiah told us that 700 years before the day, before it would all come to pass. Jesus will be and was and is God's Passover lamb. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. But before Easter week, before that momentous uh, event, those events of, of the Passion Week begin, Jesus needs a place to go. He needs somewhere where he can lay down his head. 
and he finds that place in Bethany. And that is my first point this morning, is, is that we get for this, is that God enjoys being where he is welcomed and valued. God enjoys being where he is welcomed and valued. While Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of Simon the leper. Bethany was a small village very near to Jerusalem. Jesus was uh, on his way to finish what he'd started three and a half years earlier. And this was a welcome stop. It was a welcome place where he could rest, where he could eat, where he could spend some time with people who didn't want anything from him except his company. They weren't looking for miracles, signs, nor wonders. All they wanted was him. They were content. No wonder he felt at rest there, at peace there. Bethany means house of figs, but it has a dual meaning as well. A house of refreshment and welcome. That's what the word Bethany means. So during the final week of his life before the cross, Jesus spent his evenings, his nights in Bethany with Simon the leper and his family. Isn't it interesting that Simon the leper is still called and known as Simon the leper? Isn't it interesting? Because, because stigma sticks, doesn't it? Stigma sticks. Even though he'd been healed, he was still known as Simon the leper. What do people still call you? What do people still remind you of? Jesus don't. Jesus is happy to sit with Simon the leper at his table. Jesus valued friendship and fellowship. He valued the company of those who made him feel welcome. In an in, in illustration from Frank Viola in his book called God's Favorite Place on Earth. And it's not Jerusalem. It is. but it's also this place called Bethany. It's this little house in a little town called Bethany. It was God's favorite place to be because that's where he was made most welcome. That's where he felt most valued. And so as Jesus is reclining at the table as, the, as they did, and they're talking, they're laughing, they're, uh, they're just encouraging each other. They're, perhaps they're talking about the things that they've seen and heard and done and you know, a woman comes in, and this woman we know is Mary. And she came to him with a very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. So she came in with an alabaster jar. An alabaster jar was a small stone flask. It had a very a slender neck, and it was sealed. It's like a bit like a piggy bank that you put the money in and you, the only way you can get into that piggy bank is when that piggy bank is full is to smash it and then you can get what's inside of it. Well, that was the idea with alabaster, the alabaster jars with whatever precious thing was inside. You kept it for very special occasions. And what was inside this alabaster uh, jar or vase or bottle was Spike nard, nard, which came from, they, they derived it from the root of the nard plant, and it only, which only grew on the northern um, slopes of the mountains in India. So it was something that had to be imported in. You couldn't just get it. It was so expensive, so expensive, which tells you that Mary isn't the Mary. So there's often this mix-up. Is this the Mary who is the sinful woman who weeps over Jesus' feet? And does the same kind of thing in, an, in another place. That's a different circumstance. It sounds like the same situation, but it's a different person. That's probably Mary Magdalena, who did lead a sinful life before she met Jesus. But this is Mary, the sister of Martha, who loved Jesus. So it shows that this family was probably quite well to do, if not in, 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 presently, in the past in order to have this expensive gift, this person, this heirloom handed down. And there was about a pint of this costly perfume, this nard inside the alabaster jar. 
It was worth, we're told, a whole year's wages. And we're told that by, very dutifully by the men who were around, the disciples and, and Judas. This was a, worth a whole year's wages. 300 denarii, a whole year's wages. We probably, in our ears, doesn't sound like much, 300 denarii. But, um, but let's put it into perspective in those days. Let's look at it today. To put it in perspective, a 25-year-old today, or I think it's just 2018, so, or 19, sorry, so I don't know what it is, it might have gone up since, although don't hold your breath. A 25-year-old working 40 hours a week will have a salary of approximately minimum wage, 18,100 and 36 pounds a year. Puanard was the most expensive oil and perfume you could buy in those days. And just ask you a question, the ladies, I'll ask you this question, I think some guys might know the answer, but what's the most expensive perfume that you can buy today? Anyone would like to hazard a guess, or maybe you know? No, nope, not Chanel. Anybody? So I did a Google shirt search. <laughs> and and so, so note this down now, guys, right? This is something you want to be thinking about putting on the Christmas list, right? Well, well, you need to take note. The number one a most expensive perfume in the world today is a perfume called Clive Christian Number no. One. So, Frank, if you could take note now, just remind Frank, and remind Frank that that's, this is what Jean's having for Christmas now, right? Clive Christian Number no. One Imperial Majesty perfume. Do you know how much it is? This is pocket money. Nine thousand one hundred and fourteen pounds eighty-eight, not per bottle. Per ounce. Per ounce. The bottle contains 16.9 ounces of perfume. Which means that the total cost for this bottle is £154,047.50. So you need to start saving, Frank, unless you know something we don't. So that should give you an idea of how, how much this, this nard was worth. Okay? You only ever use a tiny, tiny bit of spike nard. And usually it would be, it would be kept for weddings, funerals as well, for, for embalming as well, that kind of thing as well. But also, it was a gift you would give a king for royalty. And what did she do? She smashes the neck of it and pours it all out on Jesus' head. And all over his feet, it would have run down his beard, run down his robes, onto his feet. And she begins to wipe his feet with this perfume. Imagine how strong, how powerful that perfume must have smelled, must have been. And that smell would have stayed with him for days and days. Perhaps even throughout his crucifixion. Perhaps even still smelling on his body when he rose from the dead on the third day. Imagine that. Isn't that a beautiful thing? She poured it all out upon Jesus. God sees the value in what we do for him, even if others don't. My second point. Verses 8 to 9, when the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and money given to the poor. Oh, they're so noble, isn't they? Such noble religious social concern. They were indignant. What does the word indignant mean? Indignant mean? It means it's a feeling that's characterized by expressing strong displeasure. They were they were strongly displeased with what they were seeing. They were. It's something that what you're indignant when you consider something to be unjust. 
or something that's not justified. Something that's offensive to you. Something that's even insulting or base. We're indignant. We make indignant remarks. You can be, you can have an indignant expression on your face. Imagine the faces of the disciples. Judas was the first one, we know from John's account of this. Judas was the one to, to, to remind everybody that this could have been sold at a great price, you know, and, and, and the money given to the poor. But we're told, in hindsight, when John looks at that, we're told that, uh, that Ju- Judas didn't care really about the poor. He was a thief. And he also held the, the treasury, the, the bag, with the money in that, w- that would be prov- uh, provided for, for their everyday needs. And Judas was often caught with his hand in the bag. He probably thought nobody knew, but they did. And yet... That's the grace of Jesus. How gracious and tolerant and patient Jesus is. They all knew, or at least Jesus knew, Judas was doing this. Anyway, that's perhaps a different sermon for another day. As we near Easter, perhaps. They were indignant. Because all they could see was waste. Money going down the drain. She could have saved this for her dowry. She probably was. It, this was her future. This was her future. This was her security. Everything she'd been um, planning, her ambitions, in life, everything revolved around, around the, her, what she could save, her wealth. And she pours it all over Jesus. She wastes it on his feet. And on his hair. Mary was showing Jesus that she was putting her entire future, her security, her whole life into his hands. She was showing Jesus, Jesus, Master, this is what I'm willing to give up for you. This is what I think of you. This is how I feel about you. This is what I understand about why you came. My life has changed. It's, it's, it's transformed. You've changed me. You've healed me. You've, 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 I'll never be the same again. All the things that I once thought were so important. Now I, I pour at your feet. I pour upon you. And I look to you. You will be my protection from now on. You will be my security from now on. You will be my future. You will be my life from now on. It looked reckless to the disciples. It looked, it looked undignified to the disciples. When they saw that, they were horrified. They were indignant. They were insulted. They were offended for Jesus. They must have been like, oh, you know, you can't do that. What are you doing? And they were embarrassed for Jesus. They missed it. They missed the point of it all. They didn't see the difference between men and women. You know, today, we talk about equality and whatever. No difference between the genders or whatever. No difference between men and and women. Uh, Excuse me. Only blokes would have this attitude. We see a bit of a difference here. Why this waste? All they could see was their next car. All they could see was, I don't know, their season ticket for Manchester United, I don't know, for the World Cup. I, I don't know. But what, what would you see there being poured out? Would you see some a waste, or would you see a woman's entire heart that had been broken and shattered in so many ways, but put back together and healed? And would, would you see all of her, the, the past and all of his shame and whatever else was, 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 was there in that jar that represented her life and she poured it out on Jesus' feet? What would you see if you were stood there? It was such an undignified thing. It was a base thing. In Jewish society, you, a woman didn't unbraid her hair in public. 
Only certain women of certain types did that. But she had braids her hair and she wipes. She's crying over Jesus of his feet. She's wetting her feet, his feet with her tears, the ointment and the perfume, and she's drying his feet with her, with her hair. And the disciples are horrified. It looked reckless. But Aidan read to us just now about that pearl of great price. And we're told about that man who, who recognized the value in something. The value in something. He realized that, that to have that one thing, that pearl, that treasure, meant more than anything else in all the world. And he sold everything he had just to have it. What a reckless, reckless act. And yet, as Jesus once said, before wisdom is proved right by your children, or the proof for the pudding is in the eating, we might say, cast your bread upon the waters for many days you will find it. Set place for, for seven, even eight, because you don't know, what, you don't know how many is going to turn up. Sow your seed in the morning. Don't worry about the clouds and don't worry about the weather. Whatever. In those days, they just had to scatter it in faith, trusting that God would bring a, a great return. What might have looked like a waste and reckless, a reckless waste in other people's eyes was something beautiful in Jesus' eyes. In verse 10 and 12, Jesus it says that aware of this, he was aware of what was going on. Jesus says to them, why are you bothering this woman? They, perhaps they thought that Jesus would be absolutely on their side. You know, absolutely, boys. I can't believe she's gone and done this to me. What a waste that was. All these poor people around and whatever, we could have, homeless people, we could have given this money. Absolutely. I, 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 Mary, what have you done? <laughs> What have you, look, look at this mess in Simon's house, all over his mat and all over his table. Well, was, that, was that Jesus? Was that his, his reaction? Mr. Shock, the men. Why are you bothering this woman? Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing for me. The poor, he says, you will always have with you. So he's putting the ball back in their court now. He's using their logic. He's, 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 um, he's calling their bluff. The poor, you will always have with you. You can give to them whenever you like. But you will not always have me. You will not always have me. Recognize your priorities. Recognize what's worth, what is value right in front of your eyes. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Whether Mary knew that and whether that was her motive behind it or not, Jesus reads something prophetic in it. She did it to prepare me, to prepare my body for burial. Mary could see what these men couldn't. She could see the sacredness of that moment in the presence of Jesus. This was her worship, and these men were trampling all over it. I know what it's like sometimes. I've done it. I, I, I don't tell me you haven't. <laughs> when somebody is dancing before the Lord, or their hands are in the air, or they're doing something extravagant in a time of worship and, and praise, and they can't hold it in, they can't, they've got to sing. They've got to sing. They can't help it. And what do we do? Oh, look at them over there. Look at them over there. As Baptists, we're terrible for it. We are. Don't tell me we're not. I know we are. We might not be so much these days. This church might be a little bit better, but I've been to enough Baptist churches and been on another a, a, a traditional church up and down these valleys to know it does happen, and it is the attitude, and I've had that attitude myself sometimes. Because I don't get what's going on over there. Because I don't worship like that. Nobody else should. Everyone should worship the same way as me. <laughs> no, you worship the way you have been created to worship by God. And if you want to express yourself, express yourself before the Lord. 
And who cares what anybody else says? The Lord sees. The Lord knows. And to the Lord, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Mary could see what they couldn't. You see, the men's eyes were on this world. As much as they wanted to be on Jesus, as much as they wanted to be around him and, and, and their lives had been, they'd given up everything for him as well, mind you. Everything physically. But they had their own alabaster jars that they weren't willing to smash. So do we. Their eyes were on this world. They were more concerned about earthly, worldly things. And they were missing the point. This event was passing them by. And they were missing it. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. I wonder if they would look back on this as they would consider these things as they were writing the Gospels and feel such regret that they allowed themselves to to be the bad guys in this story. (laughs) They were being like Pharisees. And that's what Jesus was kind of reminding them of. You're being hypocrites now, boys. You're being hypocrites. You're pretending that you care about the poor. You're pretending that you're into social justice. You've got the SJW badge. You're pretending, but you're hiding behind that. All that is is a smoke screen because you don't care enough about me. And you see somebody else pouring it all out, pouring out their life before me, and it challenges you. You're offended by it because you are not like it. But you know you want to be. You know you want to be, but you just can't. Because you can't bring yourself to smash your alabaster jar and allow that precious ointment and perfume to pour out at the feet of Jesus. What stops us? What keeps us from smashing those bottles into smithereens and giving it all to Jesus? What's in your alabaster jar today? What is it? Is it pride? Is it arrogance? Is it wealth? Is it materialism? Is it family commitments? Who knows? We... You can put anything in this alabaster jar that you can elevate to be something higher than what than Jesus. Your estimation, your value of what's in your jar is greater than the the value you place on Christ. And I think what Jesus is trying to say to his disciples is be careful that you don't make an idol out of these things that you think are so important because you elevate these things above me and before me. Recognize what is valuable in life. Recognize what worth really and truly is and where it lies. These temporary things, they're all going to pass. They're all going to fade. You can't take these things with you. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The only thing you and I can take to heaven with us, do you know what it is? Is our character and other people. That's all. That's it. Nothing else. Nothing else is as important as where we stand, where Jesus, or rather, where Jesus is in your life. This is why worldly-minded people fail to see the spiritual value in anything, much at all. In the secular world, which is secular means that there's a divide between the sacred and, uh, and, the, and the earthly and the worldly. And, and many people have more, and Christians too, religious people, we can churchgoers too. But Chris, we can all fall into this trap as well of having, of having more, um, leaning more into the secular, into the worldly than in the sacred, than in the spiritual. And we've got to recognize that. Mary was there. Mary was at the feet of her savior, her master. She chose what was better. Mary was showing them up. She was showing them all up. She was the woman. 
In those days, in those days, the woman didn't mean much at all in Jewish society, in lots of societies in those days. The men were the important ones. Do you know Mary was as much a disciple of Jesus as the men were? She was the first to grasp things. The men were always, the men were always trailing behind. Mary saw it. Mary knew. She was a disciple of disciples in Jesus' eyes. In this moment, especially. The faith of this woman, the love that she poured out. They were challenged by her extravagant love and her devotion to Jesus. They didn't want to admit that, so they hid their jealousy. They behind a smokescreen of social concern and piety. Let's be careful that when we're talking about giving to the poor and feeding the hungry and clothing the, those who have no clothes and putting a roof over there, let's be careful that our social concern doesn't um, overtake our love and concern for Christ. There are many, many organizations out and about, you know, that are doing very good things. For that sec this sector of people that we, we often talk about and, are, and weigh heavy on our hearts. But we are meant to have something different to offer also. Why we do what we do is so much more important than just doing it. Jesus is challenging his disciples to stop being like hypocrites. He was calling them out. He saw straight through their charade. And what he was looking for, what's he looking for? When, they, when you're caught in that kind of a, a place and you realize it, what should be our response? What does God want to see? Denial? Jesus is saying to these men, is what he wants to see is be mature. Be mature enough now, guys. Be man enough to admit it. That you got it wrong. Be honest and learn from this woman. Learn from this woman. Mary was recognizing the seal of approval, the Father's seal of approval that was placed upon Jesus. And she did what she could to respond to that awesome messianic revelation. Kings were anointed before their coronation with precious oils and perfumes. And she was saying to Jesus, you are my king and I anoint you. She was doing the work of a prophet. And that's how Jesus saw her. As important as Samuel, as important as King David, as important as, as any prophet that had come before. We see this woman lavishing her adoration and her gratitude and her love and her worship upon Jesus. And the religious part of us thinks, that's shocking, scandalous, show some restraint, woman. Don't you realize who this is? <laughs> Irony. We might even be like the disciples and instead of celebrating the pouring out of this woman's broken heart upon the one who healed her and put her back together, we say, why this waste? How great is the love that the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called children of God. You see, see what the disciples saw as waste, put it, on, put it the other side of the coin, is God's lavishness upon us, His love. He doesn't see that as wasted. How much more precious than the most precious oil, the most expensive perfume, is the love of God the Father upon His children. God has lavished his love upon us. That an overabundance, a superabundance, an uber fullness, an overflow of the gift of his great love upon us. He has drenched us in his love and his intimate attention for us as his children. Romans 5 tells us he has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. 
whom he has given to us. It's the Holy Spirit then that shows us and reveals to us and reminds us constantly that we belong to God and that God delights in us. And nothing, there was no price that he was, he was, he was not willing to pay to have us. God delights in us. And the Holy Spirit, we're told by Paul, is the guarantee of the more, even more wonderful things to come. No eye has seen, Paul says, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. When we see what it is that he has done for us, how can we keep our lives back from our God? How can we ever think that anything is too much to give up for Jesus? We've all got an alabaster jar stashed away somewhere. We all have an alabaster jar full of something. We need to ask God to show us what that thing is so we can smash it and pour it out on the feet of Jesus. Give, Jesus says, and it shall be given to you. That'll be great. A shofar's going to go one day. A shofar's going to go one day. That trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ shall rise. Hallelujah. Sorry, right. no. I, I. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it shall be measured back to you. You give yourself to what you value most. The question you've got to ask is, what do I value most? God will remember our sacrifices, and he will reward our love for him. Truly, I tell you, he said to his disciples, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. So what did Jesus mean by that? Exactly what he said. Here we are. And here she is. Jesus made sure everyone in every generation would know about this woman. As an example A perfect example of what it means to put Jesus first in your life. What takeaway could we have from this if we haven't taken anything yet? Our seemingly small sacrifices for God might be overlooked by others in this life, in this world. But that's okay because we're doing things, we're not doing, we're not doing things for people to see. We're doing things for an audience of one. We do them because we know they please the one who really matters. We may never get a mention or a standing ovation in this life, but what we do for Jesus now will be remembered by him forever in heaven. Uh, All right, I've got to get Maximus in there. What we do in life echoes in where? Please, I viewed it enough of me. To sum up this message in one sentence, nothing gets wasted when we yield it up to Jesus. All right, two. Nothing that we're willing to give up for Christ and the gospel is a waste and will never get wasted. Amen. Father, we praise you and we thank you today, Lord. On this day, we, we, um, we remember and we think about um, that motherhood and, um, and, uh, and, and Lord, we just we, we ask, Lord God, if we're not too proud, that you would help us, Lord, to be like Mary. That you would help us, Lord God, and show us, Lord, what, um, what alabaster jars we are keeping stashed away where no one else can see it, only us. Lord, we pray that you'll show us and reveal that to us. We pray in exposing to our, to our own minds and hearts, Lord God, throughout this week as you show us and talk to us about the things, Lord God, that we are unwilling to give up for you. Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that you would cause our hearts to break as Mary's broke, to soften as Mary's was soft, where we can say, you are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am weighted and yielded and still, Jesus, have your way. Amen.